NASA talks a great deal about ISRU, in situ resource utilization on the moon. Indeed, colonizing the moon, going to the moon to stay, is going to be impossible unless we can do this. We need atmosphere, we need fresh water, we need fresh rocket fuel. None of these things are going to be possible if we have to ship them all up from Earth. It's just prohibitively expensive. So the only way to take advantage of all of this is to make use of the resources that are on the moon and nothing is more important than water ice and the big problem with exploiting this ice on the moon in Shackleton Crater and other places is the fact that NASA really doesn't know how to do it yet. I mean, we're talking about a shaded area of the moon that hasn't seen the sun for millions, if not billions of years. It's insanely cold there. It's very difficult to extract anything from this inhospitable region. And even if you can, the ice is very impure. It's likely to have all kinds of trace elements that are going to make it unusable unless we can figure out how to filter it out. Well, the UK Space Agency has taken it upon themselves to figure out how to crack this problem, and they want your help. So let's get going with part two of my exclusive interview with Dr. Megan Christian, who, by the way, is a graduate of ESA's astronaut program at the UK Space Agency. And you're going to find out all about what the UK Space Agency and NASA needs from you. Good afternoon and welcome once again to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut, part two of my interview with Dr. McGann Christian at the UK Space Agency. And I would like to once again thank the 15 people who have signed up this month alone for Patreon. You guys are fantastic. It's what makes all of this content possible. And just to remind all of you, because a lot of folks have been signing up lately and here's why. If I'm able to get to that 1% threshold, it means that, first of all, I'll never have to bug you for financial assistance again, whereas right now, every time I need to travel somewhere, I have to do a fundraising event of some kind. You need to do that during a live stream. I'm sick of that. I know you guys are sick of that as well. If I can just get that Patreon support, 1% supporting me at the $5 level apiece, I can fund these on-the-spot coverage of launches and other events around the world without having to come to you anymore. But in addition to that, you get early access to my content, you get exclusive content, and also, although I think this is a dubious benefit at best, you can also talk to me directly if you want to. Every Sunday before my live streams, I go on to my Discord server and talk to my supporters, and I'd love to talk to you as well. There's no restriction as to who shows up in that server. Anybody can drop by and talk to me and make suggestions about the future of the channel, whatever. So if you're interested in that, all the details are in the description. Let's stop talking about self-promotion and let's get straight to the interview. We covered a lot of topics during our conversation last Tuesday, and I can't wait to bring you the details details, especially about the Aqua Lunar Challenge, because it's going to be a lot tougher to exploit lunar ice than a lot of people let on. NASA talks about it like it's a very straightforward thing to make use of lunar ice for atmosphere, for drinking water, for rocket fuel, but it's very challenging indeed. The UK Space Agency has a unique way of solving this problem, so we're going to get to that right now. 
Um, backtracking real quick, because I want to make sure we cover this topic as well. Um, as far as materials manufacturing, new types of metals, that sort of thing, um, where's the benefit of doing that in microgravity versus down here? Yeah, it's a, it's a similar story. So um, crystal growth in, uh, in microgravity means that you can get larger, more homogeneous, purer crystals. Um, and you don't have contamination from the vessel that it's in uh, because it's basically, you know, it's floating. Um, if you're doing it on a dedicated platform, then you can just utilize a perfect vacuum of space. Um, you can utilize the, the temperature conditions. And so there are a whole lot of benefits that mean that you can get better crystals than you can make here on Earth. So an example, a use case of that is for semiconductors which are then used in computer chips and, and many other things, Right. Um, you can get much, much purer and so better performing devices. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like there's just a, a wealth of new technologies, new materials, et cetera, that just could benefit the, the human species so enormously. And yet, tragically, I really don't think the vast majority of people know about all that. How, how do we convey that information properly? Is it, yeah. is it just more of a, you know, we just need to make sure we talk about it more and, you know, people like myself or whatever, you know, put that out there more often? At the moment, yes. I, I think while we've known about these things through experimentation on the International Space Station for the past 20 years, um, even on Mir beforehand, um, it's still in the early stages and is not fully commercial yet. But I think as in the next few years, we're going to actually have some commercial platforms, probably uncrewed free flyers that are producing materials in space. And I think once we have the first commercial demonstration of this, then there are going to be a lot more that jump on board. Yeah. Yeah. So actually a really interesting one is, is VADA in the yes. US um, yes. who, who have sent uh, um, to make some pharmaceuticals in, in orbit. Um, going back to this uh, this biomedicine aspect, right. um, they've had some problems with FAA approval, getting it back down to yes, Earth. Yes, they have. <laughs> I've actually done some pieces of okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, if a company like that can demonstrate that this can be produced in space on a larger scale, uh, then I think everybody's going to jump on board and I think everybody's going to know about it. Yeah, let's let's hope that the FAA or, or maybe the Australians let them bring it down or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, huge stuff. Um, and then over here in this country, we want to stay UK focused, if we, the, uh, the um, Space Forge, obviously, yes. they're doing the same thing. Is, and, and then as far as ESA is concerned, the Space Rider vehicle, do, mm -hmm. you, do you anticipate that that's going to do a lot of that sort of thing as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of, of Space Rider and these other platforms, Space Forge included, is that you can, can have um, uncrewed platforms that are, that are doing uh, this kind of research and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And that has a few benefits. I mean, obviously, as an astronaut, <laughs> I, I would like to have humans in space, but there are, there are certain advantages for these things to, to not having humans on board, um, partly because it means that you can use more hazardous materials, you can use higher temperatures, um, you don't have to worry about the slow approvals process and this kind of thing. Right. So, um, and, and you don't have just the physical vibrations that you have from having humans on board. Sure. So uncrewed platforms are really important as well. Uh, so Space Rider is an example that, that the European Space Agency is, is working on. It, it passed its critical design review last year and is, uh, they're aiming for Q4 2025 for their mm -hmm. launch on a Vega C. Um, and yeah, the idea is to, to do these ki this kind of experimentation. Um, and it's an interesting one because they, um, they talk a lot about different orientations so they can have, you know, Earth observations payload as well as these kind of these manufacturing uh, payloads as well. So um, a diverse set of capabilities for yeah. that spacecraft. Interesting. Does the UK have any engagement in that particular project or is that mostly other I, companies? So it's, um, it's being manufactured in Italy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but as with our um, subscription to, to the European Space Agency, it, you know, we're involved in, sure. in one way or another. You always have some but yeah, on. here in, in the UK, you've mentioned Spaceforge, who are targeting semiconductors at first, right. um, but also planning to you know, head into to pharmaceuticals. The UK Space Agency gave them a grant last year to build a national uh, microgravity research center, which is really exciting. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I just met with them a little over a year ago I probably just before you, yeah. you gave them that grant so I guess I need to talk to them again someday <laughs> all right we're gonna move on to our last topic um, and by the way once again thank you so much um, for giving us your time today the uh, this uh, ISRU uh, contest that you have going on for lunar ice tell me about that uh, you know what are you trying to accomplish here first of all I mean don't we already know how to make ice into fuel or ice into breathable oxygen or is there something about it that that we need to do better or or find more innovative ways what's involved in this contest yeah so this this contest is called the aqua lunar challenge mm -hmm. it's um it's from our international bilateral fund so we, the the canadian space agency is running running the equivalent challenge at the same time um the idea is to uh you know challenge people to come up with innovative ways of purifying the water that we can get from the moon. Because uh, there will be a number of contaminants uh, in this ice. And so how do we get rid of those contaminants so that the water can then be used for things like water for drinking for, for people that are living and working on the moon, uh, as well as air for breathing and hydrogen for fuel as well. Right. Uh, so yeah, really challenging people to be able to produce um, clean water um, with lightweight and low power devices right. so that they can be used on the moon. And then, of course, if you think about if they can be used on the moon, then they can be used in remote environments here on Earth as sure. well. So thinking about the applications here on Earth as well. And what's involved in the process of, um, is your application process already done? And if so, what is it that folks need to do to, uh, to compete? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a, a website. It's aqualunachallenge.co.uk. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's open until I think the 8th of April. Um, they just have to put in a, a proposal for their idea, for their idea of how to, how to do this purification. Right. That's the first stage. And then the top 10 of those will be chosen to get 30,000 pounds worth of seed funding to actually build a prototype. And then the top three will be given a share of 300,000 pounds to take it further forward. How significant do you anticipate the purification issues are going to be on the moon? And then do you have any opinion about Mars and the Mars Express recent discovery of what they think anyway is all that water ice? Um, I mean, how challenging is that going to be, do you think, on other worlds? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a challenge even here on Earth. Because if you think about fuel cells, for example, the water actually has to be quite pure for, for it to work for um, and sorry, for, for electrolysis of water, for splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Right. Um, so the, the ice that's there on the moon, we don't know a huge amount about it. Right. Uh, so it's very likely that it will have contaminants, trace contaminants. I mean, it will have lunar soil, which is perhaps the easiest thing, the regolith to get rid of, but then you'll probably have um, trace I don't know, methane or, or mm -hmm. hydrogen sulfide or something like that, which are going to be harder molecules to get rid of. Do we have any indications? I mean, you just, you just mentioned methane, of course, that jumps into the mind of most SpaceX fans, you mm -hmm. know, when they think about Starship Raptor, etc. Is there any indications that there might be more methane on the moon than we're thinking? Because that seems to have been absent from most of the lunar samples. And of course, ISRU methane is a huge thing if we're talking about, you know, using Starship on the moon and that sort of thing, which of course, NASA is going to with mm. Artemis. Um, is any hope there, or are we probably going to have to truck the methane from from Earth? Yeah, it's a it's a tough one. Um, I think there is still a lot that we don't know. Um, I think in in this case, it would really be thinking about quite trace amounts, and so you'd you'd probably be more likely hoping to use hydrogen instead, um, which you know has its problems, but it's also yeah. it's also a great fuel. So. Yeah, the possibilities uh, are interesting. Is there anything else that you would like to convey to the viewers today to make sure that they know about uh, the UKSA and what you guys are trying to do? Yeah, I, I think 
we've talked about it. I think the the idea is that we are trying to bring this the the benefits of space, and there are so many. I mean, just think about the fact that the world would grind to a halt if we didn't have satellites for our navigation right. and communications. Um, but also for climate change and for for sustainability and so on. And and when we when we talk to children, it's it's really interesting because they are so concerned about these things. Um, it's, it's, been a real change, I think, over the past 20 years uh -huh. or so, just the, the amount of concern that young people have for the environment, for yeah. example. Um, and, and we really need to get the message out that space is important, plays a huge role in mitigating these problems and in solving the challenges that we have here on Earth. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much once again. I really appreciate the time you gave us today, and I wish you all the best with what you're trying to do. Thank you. And just a few more details about the challenge here in case you're interested. First of all, it's .org.uk, not .co.uk, just to be clear. In addition to that, here are the criteria. 20% of the weighing is going to be to what extent does the technology remove contaminants thought to be present in lunar water. Another 20% is to what extent is the technology appropriate for operation on the lunar surface as specified in the mission scenario. It's going to be a very difficult thing deploying technology to the incredibly cold regions of Shackleton Crater, so that needs to be accounted for as well. 12% is going to be to what extent is the technology innovative compared to the current state of the art. 12% is to what extent does the technology operate reliably. 12% to what extent has the team demonstrated a post-challenge route to market adoption and scale for their technology, 6% to what extent does the technology maximize outputs and minimize inputs, in other words efficiency, then 6% to what extent does the technology recover the contaminants from the lunar water, 6% to what extent can the technology operate autonomously without human intervention, including the extent to which it can provide telemetry, need reporting on this, as well as automation, and finally 6% capacity to deliver, to what extent does the team have the technical and commercial expertise to bring the technology forward? And although this challenge is eligible only to participants from Canada and the UK, it can involve partners who are in other countries. So if we're talking about consortiums presenting the solution, it can involve some other partners outside of these two countries as long as the lead organization submitting the solution is based in the UK or in Canada. Best of luck to you. I would like to thank Joel Ryder, who is responsible for shooting this interview in such a professional fashion, way better than anything that I ever do. He handles lots of private and corporate media related events. If you need any of that sort of thing filmed and you live in the London area, he's the guy to go to. And I have his company linked in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.